Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending um, this um, next Back to Basics webinar. Um, this one covering turning movement counts. Uh, my name is Mark Shields. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm VP of Sales and Marketing for Quality Counts. Um, I've been with the company since 2014. Uh, my background is in operations, mainly focused on completing um, anything from like traffic impact studies all the way up through um, statewide uh, coverage count programs for North Carolina and South Carolina DOT. Um, so I've seen quite a bit um, in my role as VP of Sales and Marketing. I also um, help our other offices um, uh, draft proposals for different count contracts. So I have a lot of familiarity with um, the, the various uh, data criteria that DOTs across the US um, currently have. I'm Noah, and I'll pass it on to you for your introduction. Thanks, Mark. I'm Noah Smith. I am the Director of Internal Operations here at Quality Counts. I've been with the company since 2014. Um, background is in project management, data processing, um, and I help develop our, our different uh, cloud platforms as well. Um, so a little bit of company background, again, for those of you who aren't as familiar with us, um, we were founded in 2003 and have 12 offices nationwide, um, about 5,000 clients, and we've completed over 25,000 projects um, comprised of over 275,000 counts. Um, at least that's what we have in our database currently. Um, so we have a ton of experience working with hundreds of public agencies across the U.S., Me again, meaning we're familiar with a variety of data collection practices and data protocols. Um, every firm and agency we work with has their own unique needs, and this experience um, really allows us to cater our collection and processing strategies to get you exactly what you need. Um, I like to say that if we can see it with a camera, we can turn it into an intuitive data set. Um, our clients cover a breadth of agency sizes and program requirements as well. This is just a small sample of some statewide data collection experience we have across the U.S. Um, but there are hundreds more local agencies that use QC for on-call and coverage count programs. So again, we've our client list in the public space is hundreds of hundreds of agencies long, um, and we do uh, quite a bit for them. Everything from routine TMCs and segment counts up through more uh, specialized studies, parking studies, origin destination, you name it. Um, but for the purpose of this webinar, we're going to be focused primarily on video collection, specifically turning movement counts. Um, so at the start of a project, this is some of the information that we typically request of our clients. Um, and we, we usually this stuff is just emailed over to us. So um, what they'll send us is a brief on what the project actually entails, like a little bit of background about the scope of work. Um, they also include a list of intersections and the types of data that they require, whether that's turning movement counts, um, bicycles, pedestrians, um, queue counts, um, delay, saturation flow, you name it. Um, We've we've kind of seen it all. Um, they also include any special considerations, um, anything we need to be aware of about the study area, specifics about um, how vehicles might be moving through the space, um, anything unusual that we need to be on the lookout for, and any custom data requirements or deliverable requirements that they might have. Um, when we're doing turning movement counts, um, as a standard, we classify um, movements among passenger vehicles, heavy vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians. So that data comes standard with our reports at our kind of base price that we charge for turning movement counts. Um, but that can go all the way up to a full FHWA, F scheme, like 13 bin classification if needed. Um, but we typically bin those um, into something like passenger vehicles, medium vehicles, heavies, and then multi-trailer heavies. Um, which is like a four bin count. It's very common um, here in the Carolinas. We see a lot of that work, um, but that's typically what we do um, as far as like binning those classifications is something that's a little bit more useful than having 13 bins separated out. Um, count duration is another thing, another major consideration um, when it comes to us scoping out a project, developing pricing and a strategy to actually execute the work. Um, if the project requires like mid count swaps of camera technology because our cameras last about 72 hours. Um, that's something we need to take into consideration. Uh, single day peaks are the most common requests we typically run into. So that's going to be your standard, you know, seven to nine, four to six or thereabout um, collecting in the AM and PM on a single day. But we do run into multi day counts from time to time or counts that span, say, like AM PM peak on a on a midweek day of Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, and then um, like a noon peak on a Saturday or Sunday. 
Um, 12 to 16 hour counts are becoming more commonplace as well. Um, we see these a lot in the Carolinas too, 13 hour counts from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. for a 16 hour count. Um, we are starting to see those pop up among more agencies. It is becoming more common to request all of that data so that you get um, you know, your AM, your midday um, school peak, and then your actual like PM peak um, traffic flows. The example shown contains five standard intersections, one high volume location. So when we're going through and scoping out these projects, we're mapping them out and color coding them according to count difficulty um, into kind of like what we call a standard count, a high volume count or a complex count. And those are color coded on the maps. And I'll get into this in a little bit more detail in just a second. So when we complete this mapping process and the scoping process, we might kind of go back and forth a little bit via email with questions and whatnot. Um, just to really hone in on what exactly the needs are for the project. Um, when we finalize that, we send a map to confirm all the locations and we send the quote along with that. Um, we get notice to proceed back from our client or any you know negotiation that needs to happen, contract language, et cetera. Um, but once we get that notice to proceed and we, we get the project greenlit, that's when we add it to our collection schedule. Um, we'll provide a collection date, a data delivery date, um, and then we add it to our internal scheduling tools for like our field work, um, our field staff schedules and our equipment uh, schedules. Um, as we're going through the scoping process and looking at um, some of these locations from an aerial um, perspective, I, I do want to touch on count difficulty because we get that question a lot. Like, how do you make the determination among what's a low volume or high volume or a complex intersection? So I threw some samples up on screen to show you. Um, if the intersection is large enough that it requires a multi cam setup, and usually that's about over um, roughly 150 feet, um, that's going to require cams in opposing quadrants of that intersection so that we don't have any, um, no movements are obscured by passing vehicles or, or anything else um, like, you know, sun glare or something like that. Um, that's going to require a little bit more equipment, a little bit more time in the field to set up. Um, double left or right turn movements are another component that increase the difficulty of account. That's something that we, we have to take into account. Um, offset movements are another one. Um, so this example on the right side, you can see that there are right turn movements um, from William Hilton Parkway onto these, this minor road um, in both directions of travel. So offset movements require their own camera setups. Um, usually the cameras can, they do a pretty good job of seeing up to about like, you know, about that 150 to 200 foot range. Um, but when you have movements that are that offset, you know, the vehicles start to look really small in the camera field of view. So you do have to have camera setups um, specifically for those right turn movements. Um, signalized intersections where there are lots of concurrent movements that, that can occur. Um, that's another um, consideration. If you have, you know, just a ton of lanes on one approach and they're all greenlit at the same time, you have all those movements plus right turn movements from all the other approaches that adds up to um, once that adds up to about seven or eight movements that would have to be tabulated at the same time, that's when we say, OK, this counts a little bit more difficult in your you know, run of the mill T intersection at a residential entrance or something like that. Um, so that's going to be more complex and require um, a little bit more time to process. High um, bike and ped volumes are another consideration. Any areas that have just a ton of pedestrians, a ton of cyclists, um, that's another consideration that we have to take into account when determining count difficulty. Um, unique classification schemes is yet another, um, and then roundabouts, um, and I have that on the next slide. Roundabouts are a little bit more complex. Um, when we're processing roundabout data, we have to actually track every vehicle as it goes around the roundabout and then exits. So that takes a lot more time to process. It's not just, you know, a through movement. It's It could be that the vehicle enters and goes all the way around and goes back the way it came. It could be that it likes to go in circles around <laughs> a couple of times before it finally exits. I mean, we've, we've kind of seen it all. Um, so each of these geometries that are a little bit more unique do require a slightly different plan of attack when it comes to the camera setups and capturing everything we need. So for a roundabout, we do need to be back away from the from the location. We need to be able to see the entire roundabout in a, in, in a whole um, so that we can make sure we're tracking every one of those vehicles accurately um, as it goes around. Um, single point urban interchanges, just another example, something a little bit more complex. Um, you do have these offset right turn movements away from the signalized portion of the intersection. So we do have to record those with our own independent cameras. Um, so something like this at Tybola in Charlotte would take um, a camera for the central portion that's signalized and then a um, camera at each of the 
um, right turn free flow movements. Um, so three cameras total, and those would be those would be processed as separate TMCs, but then if needed, combined on the tail end of that. Um, so you have like one single deliverable for that interchange. Um, so here's an example of what a project looks like once you get that map back um, from us. Um, this particular project was one that we completed up in Detroit. Um, there are, I th think, around like 60 to 70 pins on the map um, of individual turning movement count locations. So we send these along to our clients to verify the placement of each of the TMCs. We do want you to look at this, make sure everything's where it's supposed to be, um, make sure everything's properly labeled. Um, it's easy to do this if our clients provide like a KML or KMZ or shape file of the locations that they're wanting to survey. Um, but if you don't have that available and you just have a you know email list of locations, we'll create these maps um, and send that map link back to you to review um, to ensure that everything is um, you know everything's pinned where it's supposed to be and we're correcting and collecting data in the right locations. Um, typically, even for a project of this size, all this data is going to be collected concurrently. Um, we have 950 SPAC solution CC3 cameras and about the same number of like proprietary camera recording systems that we use um, so that we can shorten collection windows down to you know one day of the week. So for this project, we actually did collect every one of these sites plus a variety of other data, um, aerial data and some other ground level camera data um, all at the same time over the course of about five days. Um, so we every location was recorded over that five day span every day. Um, if the project's a little bit more complex, are you requiring things like queues or just any any data that's a little bit um, you know outside of just TMCs? Um, we do provide more detailed maps for those setups. So this was one we did in um, Illinois, and we had to capture the turning movement counts at each of these locations, as well as the queues at each of these locations, and then some other. Um, like railway related data as far as like the um, the actuation of the crossings and the number of trains that went across, train cars that went across, the directionality of those trains, and then when the traffic resumed normal flow. Um, so we had to collect that in addition to the TMC data and Q data for each of these approaches that are highlighted in red and yellow. Um, so when we have a more complex project like this, we're going to produce a more detailed map so that you know everything um, that we're collecting, every like the, the span of how far the cameras are can actually see. That's what those red and yellow lines are, is, is, is like roughly the, the coverage area of the cameras that we're setting up. And then the camera icons, those being the actual cameras that we're setting up in the field, um, the locations for each of those are, are pinned on the map as well with their viewing angles. So it gets fairly detailed. Um, but the reason we do this is, again, just to make sure we're covering absolutely all of our bases that, um, you know, exactly where everything's going to be set up. If you want to pass this type of information on to the agency um, that you're working with, um, whose jurisdiction covers that area, we highly recommend it. That way they can put out a little, you know, press release to say, hey, we have a data collection vendor in the area. You're going to see some cameras in the field because we do set up a lot of cameras all at the same time. Um, that kind of clears things with the public to make sure that they know what's going on. The agency knows what's going on. You know, police department knows what's going on. They're not going to get like people calling in about cameras being set up. Um, so it really just kind of clears or covers all those bases for us. Um, so once we produce that map, um, we put it in our um, MyQC order management system. So we export the KML out of the map on Google Maps, and that KML file imports directly into the system. And what it's going to do is it's going to produce a site code for every location um, and for each time period for that location. So for in this example, um, it's a little faint here, but you can still kind of see it. The site code, location, and then the time period, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. or 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. for each of these counts. So every site code is produced for every unique time period per location. This keeps basically everything in order for us. Um, so that whenever we complete a project, we can take the video associated with that site code, upload it back to this database. We can also take the data produced for the, these counts and upload that to the database as well, and they're associated back to that unique identifier. Um, this is also where we generate the field paperwork that you'll see on the next slide. So um, whenever we um, have notice to proceed for a project, we will 
click this little checklist button, enter in the deadline for the project, and then it'll produce counter checklists um, that look like this. So this is a zoomed in view just of the um, lane diagram portion of the counter checklist. Um, at the top of the checklist, you, you can't see it, it's cut out on this image, but we have all the metadata for that location. So the location name, the site code, um, fields to enter the camera number and SD card number, um, and a couple other components of, of what we need internally to be able to you know, set up and process that data on the back end. Um, we also have um, some area or some setup checklists and pickup checklists of so things that our field technicians need to do while they're in the field, verifying that the camera time is synced, um, that the memory is clear, so it's going to be able to capture everything that we're trying to record, um, that the focus is set properly, um, that the um, camera is set up at the appropriate height, and that everything within this uh, counter checklist and the field diagram is labeled properly. So in this particular instance, this was actually from a project that I did. Um, so that's my crummy handwriting on this page. Um, we had to do cameras in opposing corner, corners of the intersection, but I also ran into an issue with some construction on a nearby roadway that was causing traffic to back up to this intersection. Um, you'll actually see a screenshot of that on the next slide. Uh, but those notes are really critical to, for data interpretation. So anytime we run into issues in the field where say like an approach is closed off that we weren't aware of, maybe there's resurfacing happening, maybe the signal's out, maybe there was an accident. Um, that information is all noted on these checklists and forwarded onto our clients um, before we start processing. So we want you to be aware of what field conditions are like before we dive into all the data processing, because that's the part that takes the longest. Um, and then this is what our, the proprietary camera setup that we have is up here in this corner. You can barely see it. It's very non-intrusive. Um, those camera systems, um, like I said, record for about three days, um, and they're and they're really inconspicuous. We don't want to, you know, set up anything that's going to cause people to like, you know, look and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, we want traffic flow to be normal, pedestrian flow to be normal, so we do use very non-intrusive um, equipment to collect this type of data. So when it comes to the field deployments, we set up the. Um, well, nowadays we set up CC3 plus devices in one or more intersection quadrants. Um, we're getting more into using the CC3s over our own camera systems. They just are, are made for what we do, really. Um, we ver verify the viewing angle using an app on a cell phone or a tablet. So the camera system, the way it works, um, the CC3 plus will um, emit a, an SSID, basically a Wi-Fi signal that you will connect to using the Wi-Fi app on your phone. Um, so the same way you connect to your Wi-Fi at home, you connect to the camera using wi using Wi-Fi, and then you log into a browser page um, for that camera that is used for the setup of, of the camera. And I'll show that to you on the next slide. Um, we'll use that preview screen to verify the viewing angle, make sure we can see all the approaches, um, all the crosswalks, anything important, um, signal heads, you name it, and we'll hit record. Uh, there's also DVR functionality built into the camera system, so if we want to record specific hours, that option's available to us as well. And then once we're done setting up, we have the camera, or the, I'm sorry, the counter checklist filled out. Um, we have the camera set up. We'll safely re-enter traffic flow and navigate to the next location for setup. Any one field technician could probably complete, um, I'd say like 30 to 40 intersections in a day, um, maybe even more, just depending on how close they are in proximity to one another. So as far as scalability goes, you know, that's one of the reasons people use QC is because we can set up a lot of equipment in a very short period of time, collect a lot of data in a very short period of time, which prevents our clients from having to like factor data for different days of the week, different weeks of the year, different months. Um, we really try to keep those collection windows as condensed as possible. Um, so this is what it looks like in the field when we set up. Um, there's a telescoping pole that's about, um, on 20 or so feet in height um, when it's fully maxed out and then the camera is mounted to the top of that facing downward at an angle just to make sure you get like a good top-down view um, of the location that you're filming and then this is what the um, user interface looks like of the spec um, cc3 camera so um, pretty simple you connect to it um, it will give you a, a screenshot of what you're filming um, I shouldn't say screenshot, it's actually like a live video feed. So it'll, if you adjust the angle, it'll update the what's being fed through this um, preview screen. There's a record button. 
Um, you also have the ability to go through and look through the videos that are currently on the camera. You have the ability to schedule counts, as I mentioned before, if you want to do um, DVR functionality with that camera. And then you can set the quality parameters. Because we're collecting such a huge span of time, usually a minimum 24 hours um, of the collection day, we try to keep the resolution a little bit lower and the frames per second lower um, so that we're not consuming all the space on the camera because it really just kind of bogs things down a little bit when you're going to download the camera when we're processing it through data lens it just takes more time when you have a larger file um, so we try to use this balance setting on the camera um, but if you do have a project that requires high definition footage for any reason we do have that option available to us using this camera or other technology we have um, here you know at qc so the telescoping pole gets mounted to nearby infrastructure, either using um, ratchet straps or just like nylon straps or um, these little hose clamps. And so in this case, I was setting up on a sign using a hose clamp um, and that'll stay out in the field for usually um, we'll, we'll set up like on a Monday, let it run through the recording for the full next day and then pick up on Wednesday or, or whatever day of the week that is, set up on a Tuesday, let it record through Wednesday, pick up on Thursday. Um, or however long the, the survey period may be. So we try to capture more video than what's actually needed. Um, and the reason being, if you come back and it turns out that, say, for instance, your, um, you know, you, you thought that the PM peak was four to six, but it's actually 430 to 630 and it's offset a little bit. We do have that footage still stored that we can go back and reprocess that additional footage without having to return to the field to record that additional 30 minute interval. So. That happens more often than you might think, um, where we do have to go back and process additional footage. Um, we also, for a lot of our clients, will pr we'll produce the footage, send that to them. They'll look at the footage to kind of guess when peak times are, and then we'll process the peak times that they provide um, to us based on you know their review of the footage. So that happens quite a bit too. If if it's you know of interest for you to look at that stuff first, or look at accompanying tube data. Um, or other data before you determine count times, that's perfectly fine and something we do fairly routinely. Um, so when everything is collected and brought back from the field, um, we connect to the camera and we download um, everything to a local computer. So we connect to the cameras using Wi-Fi or a USB-C cable, download all the footage. Um, once that's complete, the field technician will log into our cloud portal um, for data lens open up the project and upload each video to the appropriate location. At the same time they're doing that, they're also entering in some camera parameters like the location of the camera, the mounting height, the type of camera that it is. Um, some of these fields are optional, so if you end up using data lens down the road um, yourself, don't feel like you have to fill all this stuff out, um, but it does help us track things internally because we can see you know, some patterns in that data. So based on a certain mounting height, is there is there greater accuracy for a higher mounting height than a lower mounting height, or maybe we have issues with certain cameras that you know we can kind of um, hone in on because we're keeping tabs on the camera um, serial numbers when we're entering all this information in. So the field technician will enter all that camera metadata and then use the map to document where the camera was placed and which direction it's facing. Um, at this point, the project is then pushed to internal operations um, for processing the actual data, and that's where I'll hand things off to Noah to cover um, the next slides. Thanks, Mark. So let's talk video processing. The uh, oh, if you can go back one slide. Sure. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do um, to kick things off is fire up our brand new quality counts particle accelerator. Totally kidding. That's not what this is. We're smart, but we're not that smart. What you're seeing here are actually vehicle tracks for an entire count period. Uh, that our data lens artificial intelligence platform uh, has created after it processed the video. Um, as each file is uploaded, the AI is going to process the video. And next slide, please. And so for each vehicle that the software detects moving across the screen, you're going to get a detection, which is a green dot. It's going to follow the. It's going to trace the path that the vehicle took, which we refer to as a trajectory in blue, and then a termination when the system loses track of that vehicle, and those are marked with the red dots. And so, once our internal operations staff pulls up the project in data lens, pulls up each count, 
and they can just perform a simple visual inspection of the trajectories uh, for each count period, and that helps them decide, all right, we're going to continue processing this in data lens, or we're going to send it out for manual counting. But next slide, please. So for the counts that are going to be processed by the AI, uh, the staff just overlays these directional zones or gates, as we call them, um, over each leg of the intersection. You can see those as the green polygons labeled northbound, southbound, eastbound, westbound. And those gates uh, allow the AI to assign the turning movements for each vehicle uh, just simply by using the gate inside which the uh, detection and termination dots uh, reside in. So if a vehicle is entering from the right side of the screen, it gets detected in the northbound leg, travels across the intersection, is up there in the top left inside of the southbound uh, gate, then the system will count that as a northbound through movement. You can see down at the bottom of the screen, um, next to the directional labels, there's a little right turn toggle that you can turn on and off for each approach. That will enable right turn on red reporting. Uh, that's built into the system. You can turn it on for one leg, all of them, whichever ones you want to see the right turn on red reporting for. Uh, the pink lines are the are how pedestrians are tracked and you can see for example on the left side of the screen the pink line labeled w for west leg any pedestrian trajectory uh, that crosses that pink w line will get counted as a pedestrian crossing on the west leg of the intersection next slide please so after everything gets counted um, you've got quite a few options to download the reports um, in different class bins, everything from uh, just a simple passenger and heavy uh, through the three bin and four bin that Mark mentioned, all the way up through the count.csv, which is actually an eight bin classification system. Next slide. And so once everything is counted, we've got all the turning movement data. We're going to import that into our proprietary quality control software. And that software is going to allow us to run uh, automated tests at the micro level, the intersection level, and kind of a, a big picture macro level, which is what you're seeing here. Uh, we're looking at at the top of the screen. You can see a couple intersections along a corridor and at the bottom of half of the screen you can see that we're balancing the entering and exiting volume for each of those intersections. And you can do that across the entire count period. You can do that across five minutes of the count. You can just look at the peak hours. Uh, it's very flexible. Lots of options for the macro level screening. And next slide. This is a picture of um, the kind of micro level where we're just looking at one count period. And on the left side of the screen, you can see a list of flags uh, that the software is seeing things in the data that it wants um, it wants us it wants to bring to our attention for us to check out manually. Stuff like impossible movements, empty intervals, high intervals. Uh, in this particular account, this project U-turns were very important. So we just told the system for this count just flag all of the U-turns. Uh, so we can make sure that we're we're checking those out on a case by case basis. Uh, so once all of these flags have been checked out, once any corrections have been made, um, that's when the data will get uploaded to its final destination. Next slide. Which will be on the MyQC platform that Mark mentioned earlier. Your count data is going to live here indefinitely. It's not going to expire. You can go in. 24 7 generate different reports uh, we've got a number of different options for standard reporting um, and of course we also offer custom reporting solutions if you have specific details that you need the data formatted into uh, including for our data point customers uh, data point is our traffic count management cloud platform um, if you've got a data point subscription we can just port that data directly from my qc into your data point instance uh, for a seamless data experience. 
So that will wrap it up for a presentation. I believe we've got time for questions. Doesn't look like there are any. If you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'll give it another minute. Um, see if anybody has anything that they wanted to send in um, for us to answer. But that does wrap it up for us. If you need to reclaim a little bit of time for yourself. Pricing for 72 hours. Um, good question. So pricing is going to depend on um, the location itself and um, where it is. Um, we have different pricing, different offices, different agencies that we work with. Um, so it, it's really going to depend. If you have a specific location in mind, though, you can definitely email that over to us. We can send you a, a pricing sample or get you a rate sheet um, for the office nearest to you. Um, so feel free to reach out info at qualitycounts.net. Um, or you can email myself, mshields at qualitycounts.net. Um, I'll drop both of those in the chat. So you have them. Will QC process count videos taken by someone else? If so, what is the fee for TMC and 24 hour ADT counts? Um, we do process video taken by other people. We actually do this for a couple of public agencies where um, they previously were using Maya Vision and they started sending their video to us to process instead. Um, but again, it really depends on intersection size. Um, for ADTs, depends on how many lanes you have going in each direction. Um, but again, if you reach out to that email address, I can provide you with pricing. Um, data lens available now, now or is it coming in the near future? We are very close to releasing a public facing data lens application. Right now, you can still use it. Um, but you got to kind of work through us in order to process the video and return the data. Um, but we still honor that same pricing model that we use for whether you're doing a self serve or we're doing it for you. Um, so reach out to infoqualitycounts.net. I can provide you with more details on that front. Um, recently had a project requiring time lapse photography for the duration of construction. Do you have such a service? Um, so our camera systems, we have battery packs that can extend the life to about a week. Um, we have done that before, um, either using like drone and aerial photography. Don't know that we've done it with just our standard cameras, but we can film, like I said, for up to a week and just swap out the cameras um, in order to pull the video off of them and to make sure we have enough storage to continuously collect. So it is something we can do. Um, there's a lot of video only projects that we've completed where we just are out collecting video for people um, not actually processing any data. Um, and I can provide a price quote for you if you just shoot me an email. Um, is the classification data also generated through your AI processor? Um, yes, the AI processing tool detects the classification of the vehicle. Um, and right now, like I said, I know I think it. You, you mentioned eight bins. Is that what we're up to? <laughs> I know it's it's been expanded quite a bit recently. Um, we're constantly improving that model and training it with additional imagery to make sure that the accurate the accuracy of the classifications are like completely up to our standard. Um, yeah, yeah, currently, go to, go ahead. currently we have we can class. Uh, it's all built on the FHWA. So right now we do FHWA one through five and separate bins, and then a bin for six and seven, a bin for eight, nine, and 10, and then a bin for 11 through 13. That's our current eight bin scheme. Yeah. Um, if you have a previous count, would you resell it to another company? Um, it depends. Our standard service agreement, typically we kind of reclaim rights to the data after a certain time period. I believe it's, I believe it's six months. Um, but there are agencies that we're under contract with and firms we're under contract with that we can't resell their data. Um, so in that case, we just mark those counts within MyQC as private, um, and we don't resell that stuff to the public. Um, some cameras are able to take a shot every few seconds or minutes for a month or more. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, what is it? Sincera, I believe, is a is a camera specifically made for construction observations. If that's something that's of interest, I can send you more information about it. It's something we looked into the past for our, um, for our own counting needs, but um, it's built more for like that kind of long duration counting, like you mentioned. 
And I think they have some built in tools like um, you can get solar panels for them if you don't have power. Um, and you can um, remotely download video. I think they even have like motion sensor capabilities as well. Um, but it, again, if you shoot me an email, I can send you a little bit more information about that camera system. Um, website to see your previous counts. Yes. Um, if you go to qualitycounts.net, um, at the top of the page, there's a data archive link. If you click on that, you can see stuff that we've collected um, in the past, whether that's segment data um, from ATR counts or turning them accounts. Um, you can also see where we have video available if you want to download video for a specific account. Um, thank you for the compliment. A um, couple questions. What if there is unexpected situation like broken camera or crash? Do you guys go back and collect on another day or use any other methods to extrapolate data for down periods? We only produce ground truth data. We do not extrapolate or estimate counts. Um, so in that case, we would actually go back out and recollect. Um, if it's really of no fault of either of us, no fault of our own, just camera went out for some reason, or um, say there was an accident in the intersection, so it impeded traffic flow for too long of a period, um, rendering that data you know, not usable, um, we don't be able to go back out and recollect. So we'll just go out, refilm, and send you that data um, you know, as soon as we can put like as quickly as we can get it processed. Um, that has happened in the past where we'll deliver like the entirety of a project and then we have like maybe a straggler site or two due to like a you know a signal issue or an accident that we then send um you know just shortly after your due date. So um yeah, we will go back out and recollect. And for the second yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Um, is there any process to check the accuracy of counts done by AI system? If yes, what is the typical accuracy you guys aim for? No, you want to take that one? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when we when we started to build, like from the very beginning, when we were building this the AI system out, like our top one of our top goals was like we're not going to accept, we're not going to reduce the accuracy that we're committing to as we build this platform out. So every every single count that we process in the AI. We do a short calibration count. We'll we'll just do a manual count for a short period just to make sure that everything lines up with what the the AI system is telling us. And anything less than ninety eight percent requires some investigation. That's that's what we're we're aiming for. I'll give it another couple of seconds. And um, yeah, Stephen posted a link to the um, data portal so you can check out what historical data we have available. Well, I think that's it. If anybody have, um, posts anything after this, I can um, respond to you directly. Um, thanks so much for attending. Really appreciate it. We had a really great turnout, a lot of really awesome questions. So definitely appreciate the engagement. Um, we will we'll be having these on roughly a monthly cadence. Um, the next one we're going to have um, in July will cover um, segment counts and um, managing larger routine coverage count programs. Um, so definitely stay tuned for that. More information will come out at a later date. And thank you so much for attending.